the session is called Renewal, Reinvigoration, Reform, a Roadmap uh, for a Successful Europe. And um, the liberal spirit is definitely something that all unites us, um, although I'm sensing already there is a little bit of differentiated uh, interpretations at times to what liberalism really means. Um, and while there is a good mood and the liberals really feel good about um, where they stand in terms of percentages, um, there's also a general sense that uh, Europe is in a particular, again, uh, sort of at a, a crossroad, uh, there are certain, certain challenges. And I think one of the things we definitely need to keep uh, reminding us that uh, Europe is a project that's not done. Um, and it serves a particular purpose, and that means there are adjustments along the way. Um, there is not one set goal, but we are all part of shaping it. Um, you two prime ministers, you've uh, provided us some really um, interesting and inspiring sort of your visions and thoughts about what Europe is, and I would like to give our fellow panelists also an opportunity to share with us sort of what they um, uh, sort of think are the sort of upcoming challenges and um, but also are there some things that have resonated in the two uh, speeches that we've just heard so Gwendolyn Rutten maybe I can turn to you mm -hmm. uh, as a start just to how does it resonate what you've heard and maybe you have some marks, sparks you mm -hmm. want to provide for the debate as well. Well, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon to all of you. And Mike, thank you for hosting us here in Amsterdam. Um, we have a, a liberal government in Belgium as well, a liberal, liberal prime minister as well. But I dare to say after last night experiencing Amsterdam, you're definitely the most liberal city in the world. <laughs> <laughs> It's work hard, I play it, hard. I hope it was positive. Yes, yeah. absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Work hard, play hard. Um, I've listened very, very carefully to, um, to what you've said, both of you said before. Um, and of course, if we think about the future of Europe and we think about the future, um, we need to be practical. We need to deal with what's on people's minds. But more important, I think, is that you need great ideas and strong personalities. <laughs> and if you look at us, if you look at this liberal gathering, I might say we have both. We have strong personalities and we have great ideas. And so I think uh, in order to uh, pin out a roadmap for the future, let's try to sum up what's really important. For me, it's three things. It's people, it's prosperity, and it's about peace. People, European Union needs to be a union of the people, by the people, for the people. And for now, it's, it's a Europe of institutions. It's a Europe of agencies. It's a Europe of too many laws and too many regulations. Um, if we really want to make it a Europe for the, for, the, for the people, let's have a smaller union, a union more focused at its key <laughs> um, goals and its key missions. And let's make it a union that is reaching out for the hearts of people with projects like Erasmus, so that people can learn and study in different languages, which is also a great thing. Um, I'm from Belgium, which is a complicated country, and we often have these debates on French speaking or Dutch speaking, um, Wallonia and Flanders, it's really complicated, Brussels in the middle, and then still some German speaking people living there. And I always say in Belgium, and it's the same in Europe, at the end, it's not the language that you speak, it's the ideas that you share. And if we share those ideas, we can really build a Europe for the people. So Erasmus programs, that's one thing. Um, I would love to vote for Mike Rutte, for example, when he runs for the European Parliament, perhaps one day, or for um, Albert Rivera. <laughs> Maybe I would love to vote for him. So why can't we do this as European citizens? Vote for each other as Europeans. Um, also, perhaps Europe needs to really deal with the problems that are on top of people's minds. Migration, it has been said before. That's on top of people's minds. And I think instead of... I don't think people are really against migration, to be honest. I think what they're against is the fact that it's such a chaos and that we're not able to manage it. I think we need a more active policy on migration, so when we, that we can make it a, a positive thing. 
that we can really have a new Steve Jobs, a European Steve Jobs here, for example. But we don't have that now. In, in the US, 200 years ago, they had Ellis Island. They knew how to deal with it. We, we still don't have anything. So let's have one migration policy. Let's have a border policy. Let's do this together. So that's, that's Europe of the people, in my opinion. People, prosperity. That was the second thing I've heard. Um, both of you mentioned it. That this is why we need this free market to work for everyone and not just the few. Uh, this is really important. Liberal Party should be a party that works for the middle class for everyone, so everybody can move forward uh, in his or her life. Uh, it's also simple things. Uh, the digital agenda, for example. Um, did you hear about the story, the, the Spotify story? It's a Swedish company that had to move to the United States <laughs> because it was successful uh, as a digital company, but you, you have to deal with 28 or in the future 27 different uh, agencies or, or regulators here in Europe. Let's make this happen. Let's make it happen for people, for prosperity. I think it's a really good thing that the roaming uh, disappeared, not only when you go on holiday, but if you want to communicate together, let's, let's do these kind of things. Let's make prosperity happy, happen for everyone. And thirdly, I will keep it brief, peace. I, th I loved what you said before. Um, we are a Nobel Prize winner. We won the Nobel Prize for Peace as a European Union. This is what we did. <laughs> yeah. And then yet, over the last year and over the last two years, we've been faced with, with terrorist attacks. So we should realize that peace is not only something, it's not a passive thing. It's something that we have to work on actively. We need to engage more. We need to organize ourselves. Not only using soft power, but also using hard power. Uh, we can no longer depend on the United States. Who are we going to call? Donald Trump? Seriously? <laughs> Let's do this ourselves. Let's organize ourselves. It's a smart thing to do. <laughs> yeah, cheers. <laughs> and Mike, I know we disagree uh, perhaps a little bit on this point. It's a smart point. It's a smart thing to do. Um, to work together and to build perhaps not a European army, but a European defense policy. It's also cheaper. If you have 27, that's a good argument. If you have in 27 countries, um, 27 different armies, well, it, it just costs you a lot of more money. So j let's just do this. Let's, let's live up to what people expect. Like, let's make this a union of people, prosperity and peace. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm definitely going to pick up on the migration issue since all, of th all three of you have mentioned it, but I'm also very glad to hear that there is a career for life after being a prime minister. Um, so, I <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nicola Beer, thank you very much for being here, um, sort of showcasing the German liberal viewpoints. And I also wanted to ask you, invite you to, uh, what are some of the points that maybe resonated with you from what you've heard so far? Um, and I, I would an like accent yes. that you maybe yeah. also want to I would like to tie up the both positions a little bit because, of course, I think we are in a situation uh, when uh, Europe wasn't really well in shape last year and the year before um, to be more pragmatic, to uh, solve problems, um, to attack the task we have. And a lot of those tasks you mentioned uh, in the border policy and uh, defense policy and others, migration policy. But I think that Prime Minister Serrar is right that this pragmatism, it has to join up with our values and a new idea of European Union for the people. I mean, we started as European Union with an idea after Second World War with the idea of peace, of freedom, of prosperity for the people. And then we built up all those institutions, regulations, and it became too much because the bureaucracy formed the first side of Europe and not the Europe of the people. But I think that to attack all the tasks we have now, and it, there are new tasks, has also to readjust the idea, to rebuild, to have a quite um, European um, profile on values, on principle, and then to have the instruments to attack those uh, tasks and to have the right solutions in it. And maybe that the liberal 
that the free democratic power in this Europe is the only political movement that can tie those two points together. Um, I don't want only uh, a European Union of uh, institutions which are working better than they do for the moment. Um, I think that the free democrat, uh, free democrat, the liberal ideas have to dominate what are the principles to do those works. And so I think this uh, of tolerance, respect, freedom um, is uh, quite important to line up together all what we want to change in the work of the institutions. And maybe at the end, uh, Prime Minister Ritter, also those institutions to be more democratic, to work um, uh, with more speed and bring better solution for all people in Europe. But in the center, we have to have the people, their future, and especially the freedom to decide about their future and not be decided by other people, institutions or governments. Okay. Thank you. As I said, I would love to pick up on the subject matter of um, migration. And it's about, I think we're all in agreement, the current migration policies that exist in Europe need uh, reform. They need to be revisited. And I would like all of you to sort of comment a little bit more on it. Um, Prime Minister uh, Serra, you are coming from a very mono-ethnic uh, society, Slovenia. Um, not a lot of diversity when it comes to race. You've not... Uh, delivered on the quarter that the European Union sort of has set for you. Um, I think both Bel all Belgium, Germany and the Netherlands are quite diverse countries already. Um, you, are ne you already need to deal with the sort of diversity in a very different ways by very much sort of looking at um, the assimilation or integration process. Um, we're also looking at the migration issue from very different aspects in terms of we have people f fleeing from war, um, economic destitution, um, and so there needs to be a differentiation as to who is coming. Um, and I think you know, the, the FDP put already some proposals forward as sort of these consulta consultative uh, talks were happening in, in, in Germany. Um, one thing I kind of want to throw out there, and I know it's a bit controversial, um, Angela Merkel did the right moral thing, people argue, by letting refugees come to Germany. So it was sort of a hu very much uh, a human rights thing. I think there is no question that Germany her, was sort of overwhelmed by the numbers, plus what to do then on the ground. I want to throw out, though, that her moral leadership empowered people on the ground to then step forward and come forward with solutions. Um, so, you know, providing shelter, getting involved in civil society organizations and, and helping out with schooling, language training. So I want you all to comment a little bit more and put forward from your respective countries some concrete ideas that should be picked up by Europe moving forward, how we can deal with um, the, the migration, or sort of differentiate a little bit the issues at stake. Prime Minister, Rudy, you're holding the thing already, please. Well, uh, uh, this goes back to the values. Eh? Of, for me, Europe is, is a values-based organization, uh, very much uh, anchored in the liberal values, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, because they are the core of all of our societies. And this is exactly where Miro was right in saying that in countries where these values are not uphold or even threatened, that we collectively have to take action. I, I completely agree. For me, Europe is values. For me, Europe is collective security. The fact that we work together, that we act together, creates also a collective sort of safety, a sense of security in a very unstable world. Uh, there's a lot happening outside, uh, and particularly around the European Union, from Africa, the Middle East, to uh, what is happening between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, and thirdly, the European Union is about uh, trade, uh, jobs, uh, the digital single market, Nelly Kroos sitting here, the former commissioner who designed this uh, digital agenda, which is still not implemented, and it would add so many jobs. Now, back to your question. Of course, also on migration, these values guide us. That means that somebody who is threatened by war, uh, we should always be willing to uh, try to give shelter to that person. But then the question is, 
first of all, do we all in the European Union uh, do what is necessary and not just let this be done by just three or four countries like Sweden, Germany, the Netherlands and Belgium? And secondly, do we always have to give that protection here in Europe or can we organize that protection elsewhere in an acceptable way, closer to where the conflict is taking place so that people can go back if the conflict is over? And that is why I was happy during our presidency to work on this EU-Turkey agreement where people get protection in Turkey, we pay for that, we uh, uh, make sure that certain standards are upheld, but this means that people don't have to travel, uh, that this business model of the boat smugglers has been not completely killed, but at least, and I'm a liberal, I'm in favor of business models, but not in favor of this business model, because it is uh, against any uh, basic human uh, dignity uh, that people have to pay and then in life-threatening conditions have to cross the Aegean or the Mediterranean Sea. So, yes, we should be willing, always, uh, to help people uh, in need. But again, all 28 then have to deliver, not just four or five. And secondly, uh, uh, when it can be done in the region, to an acceptable, to an acceptable standards, etc., like now with the Turkey Agreement, I think that is an alternative which we need uh, to pursue, like we did now with the EU-Turkey Agreement. Thank you. And, and thirdly, to maintain the, the, maintain the uh, uh, acceptance in society of doing this, we need to be able to send back irregular economic migrants. This was what the EU-Africa Summit was all about. That in a very discreet way, we have to be able to tell Africa, we want to invest in your future, we want to help, etc. But part of this deal needs to be that irregular migrants who are not trying to get away from war and poverty, uh, but just trying for economic reasons to come to the European Union, that we can send them back. So, if I can push you on two things. So, what do we do if we want to send migrants back, but the countries where they're coming from are not willing to take them, one, and then B, we have the situation in Libya, where we have in those reception centers uh, slave smuggling coming up now. So, it's a form of business. Well, yeah. I, I discussed this with, uh, I was last week in Mali, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, and this came up, of course, in all the discussions okay. I had in these, uh, in these countries. And I, I said, well, I, I find it horrendous what happens in, in Libya. The, the CNN footage is, is to totally unacceptable, what we have seen on television. But then the question is, do we, as Italy and Malta and the rest of the European Union, have to take the people from the camps into Europe, or leadership in Mali and Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire and all the other African countries, are you willing to take these people back? And I think this is the right answer, for them to take them back. They cannot just say to the European Union, hey, this is awful, you have to take them. No, why have they left your country in the first place if there is not a war going on? Uh, why have you not been able to provide for a future in, in that country? And of course, we are willing to help. We invest massively in African countries through development aid and trade and, and uh, more, more modern uh, uh, relationships. And that includes more for more and less for less. If countries are not willing uh, to accept their part of the deal, we have to be willing to, to also make that felt in terms of, of the amount of development aid and other investments we are putting in these countries. Mm. Uh, I think that's, that's crucial. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Serra, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I am going to go to do so. Um, Prime Minister Rutte has said it's the responsibility of t all 28 uh, EU member states to sort of chip in on when it comes to migration. What are your views, yeah. given that you've had your own challenges in your country when it comes yeah. to refugees? I think that uh, our uh, SMC party really helped our government to do the right thing in the time when it was in 2015 and 16 when about half a million of people passed through Slovenia. Some stayed, but much more passed up to the north. We were humane. We provided them with shelter, food, uh, medical assistance, everything, uh, security. There were no conflicts, no, nothing happened really, even though 10,000 per day were coming sometimes, even more. Then we were solidary, and also some other countries were helping us with police forces to uh, 
master this big um, uh, this big flow. But uh, this is very important to do this according to the principles of solidarity, 28 together, all countries actually together, just also the Balkan countries and all other non-EU non member countries. And then thirdly, which is really important and uh, wasn't mentioned before, we must take into account our capacities, our integration abilities, because it is morally right to help the person who is fleeing for his or her life. Definitely, we all agree on this. It is even right to take some economic migrants. If you have a job for them, if you can provide for the children, I mean schooling and all other things. But if you take thousands of them and then you put them on the margin of the society, you don't provide anything for them, then you create another problem for them. They are disappointed, angry, lost, discriminated if you want, no human rights for them no social rights, etc. And they are also then uh, sometimes some of them security threat for the, for the citizens. Because uh, in, in, in this case, we all lose. And this is why we, we must take people fleeing from Africa, Asia, all uh, other parts of the world into Europe in some organized way. There must be organized way. This is important to take them as many as we can at, ta at a time, to be solidary, all 28 members of the EU and other countries together, to work, uh, to cooperate on this, and of course to be humane, this is very important. To do all you can to, to convince your own people, who are sometimes scared, sometimes they are full of some fear uh, caused by populists, that they must take this as something urgent for them and for those who are coming. And this was uh, quite a challenge in Slovenia because some right-wing parties started to demonstrate, they were trying to expand fear among the people. For example, there was a school with 17 uh, young boys and girls from abroad, they came as migrants, as uh, refugees, and there were demonstrations around the school motivated by right-wing parties, even uh, parliamentary members and so against them. It was crazy. And this is where our party, SMC, played a very crucial role in uh, promoting this humane idea of taking care for the refugees by doing this uh, in a way which is safe for everybody. And so I basically agree with uh, all of you. And I think this is a great challenge for us. We must do much more in Africa, in the countries of origin of crisis. We must protect our borders from irregular migrations. And we must be humane and uh, we must help those who come to get integrated into our society, to become one of us. Thank you. Yes. Well, um, Europe is an unfinished construction. And whenever there is a crisis, it shows. Uh, it did so when we had the financial crisis, and then what happened uh, two summers ago was um, exactly the proof of the fact that we don't have a real asylum or migration policy in Europe. Um, we just weren't ready. And what people saw were thousands of people marching barefoot sometimes in misery through Europe. Can you imagine what this does? not only to the people marching, but also to Europeans watching it, you know? It's like, what's happening? We weren't ready. And I think the solutions in, Tur in Turkey and, and was in short time perhaps a good solution, but it's not a final solution. We have to do this ourselves. We created this beautiful, this beautiful free space where you can travel freely, where you can study, where you can do free whatever you want as a European citizen. But we didn't think about our borders. We didn't think about how are we dealing with people who want to come in. And we have Africa as a neighbor, you know, the youngest, poorest continent in the world. So we need to think about it. And my suggestion would be, and that's what we all say, of course, you cannot talk about values and then not live up to them. We need to live up to them. So when it's about asylum policy, we should prove the world that our words are worth something. 
because we cannot go around the world and say, uh, what are you doing? You're not living up to human rights and then not even not being able to deal with it ourselves within the union. Secondly, when it comes to economical migration, that's the big elephant in the room, right? It's the big elephant in the room. We don't have a positive policy on economic migration. We just close our eyes and think we can ignore it. It's better to open the debate. It's better to think about strict rules. What do we want? What do we need? What can we offer? And then if we have one policy, perhaps we're better f we can stick up for the future and make it a positive story. Thank you. It's a perfect segue to <laughs> Nicola Beer, because yeah. the FTP I, I totally agree, because I think it's really time to stop this lie that the European uh, continent is not a continent of migration. We had migration all the um, years through. We have migration and we will have migration and even we need migration when I look at the numbers of our birth rates. So we need migration but the question is how to organize and uh, how to have fair and transparent regularities to be human on the one side, so for asylum si seekers, for refugees and to have fair and transparent system like in Can Canada or in the United States or New Zealand for those who want to migrate because of economic reasons. There I think we also have the right to point out which for us are the um, important points um, to ask for somebody who wants to come to live and to work together with his family in our center uh, together with the society here. So we have to have a clear system for migration. Um, of course, uh, Prime Minister Rutte is uh, right, saying there is also to have uh, regulations how to send somebody back who is irregularly coming and not respecting uh, the regularity we set out. But, and in the same time, um, I'm very um, agree with what you said about the treaty with Turkey. That discussion we have for many, many years and we didn't act, we didn't deliver, not in the member states and not in the European Union. And so I think the treaty with Turkey only bought us time, but now we have, we bought two years and we didn't act, we didn't deliver as well. And for my reason, when we speak about values, I feel really bad to have such a treaty with a state as Turkey, who becomes less and less a democracy, couldn't be member of the European Union while we as free democrats in Germany said we have to stop to negotiate with Turkey. For the moment this treaty is maybe the only reason where, uh, why, um, for um, continuing those uh, negotiations. I think, I think that uh, we really have to bring up our own system with our values and with clear, a clear system, a fair system and not being in a position that Turkey helps us because we do not deliver in Europe with our principle and values. <laughs> this was too cozy. Now we need some, some, some tough debate on this one. Uh, because, yes, I agree, Turkey is at the moment, uh, and it is not in the foreseeable future expected that they will uh, live up to our standards of membership. And that means that at the moment oh. these negotiations are dormant. Eh? They are the basically not no taking talks. place. Exactly. But if we would say we can only close deals like we did with Turkey, with countries who live up to all our values and all our high standards, that means that you will go back, it is my absolute conviction, to the scenes we have seen in 2015, which led to the impression in Germany and the Netherlands and Sweden that we are out of control. And the worst thing you can do as a government is to be out of control. And the biggest present you can give to the, to the, wrong, side, to the wrong type of populist is to give the impression that you are out of control. So yes, the standards in a country with which you make such a deal, like with Turkey, has to be to the level we find acceptable. But we, if we ex expect for that whole country to be like sort of Switzerland, then these deals will never emerge. And that means that these uh, uh, big flows of migrants, even real migrants in this case, because they were really uh, uh, getting away from war 
uh, and, and from very uh, difficult situations in Syria, uh, that these will continue. And, and that will mean that, uh, uh, and, and that in the end, will be the biggest present the FDP can give to the alternative for Germany. <laughs> Prime Minister Serra or Gwendolyn Ritten, do you want to respond to the Turkey issue? Well, of course, well he's a Prime Minister. He needs to be careful. In <laughs> 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 we are but among but friends I mean, of here. Of course, so. in, 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 in world politics, um, uh, you, you, you sometimes need to make deals with countries you don't like and or, who don't r reflect our values. That's true, of course. But the real question is, is this the way we want to continue or can we find another solution? And that was the point that we made. Um, we didn't do anything over the last two years to improve the situation. I think uh, you have the Geneva Convention. The values are reflected in the Geneva Convention. We share them as a European Union. Why can't we just translate them in one, one migration policy for Europe, not 27 with differences, and in one country you get a yes, and in another country you get a no, and perhaps we can try to move on because we have better chances in Belgium than you have in Hungary. No, let's just deal with this in one way, a European way. That, that's what we need to do. And, and, yeah. and then secondly, of course, when we talk about protecting the borders, that's what we need to do. That's what I really think we need to do. One sentence on this, because I agree with Gwendolyn, because now the refugee, him or herself, decides to live in either Slovenia, Germany or the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And that's crazy. It should be Europe to yeah. tell oh, yeah. that Absolutely, refugee yeah. where to live, in Lithuania, in Sweden or in Spain. Yeah, but in the same time, it was part... <laughs> uh, that's right, but in the same time, it was part of a lie and of not delivering, not acting as a European Union or even as a member state to have this border, Dublin border system and to leave alone all, all those countries on the border, also in Germany. I mean, our, we, we were criticizing this uh, um, um, government in Germany because of leaving alone all those countries at the border with their problems, with the, with the chaos which, which came with so many, many, many refugees. And so I'm really for one European solution, which takes also, in my opinion, which has a chance to have a reunification and, and a renewal of the European Union, even um, to come over the splitting we have for the moment of some countries accepting migration, some countries, how um, yours, being a little bit uh, um, more diplomatic in this and, and, and reductant to, to this, um, because I think if we discuss what is needed, not only in institution and regularities, but also in integration of those people coming, or um, if asylum seekers, refugees, or migrants for economic reasons, then we can maybe have one system, one idea, and one integration system. We can maybe give funds for that, but um, to have really resolved the task we have to deliver, uh, and not only to have some more administrative, um, better, better um, administrative solutions, but really to have living our values and helping people and at the same time um, being more together than we are for the moment because for the moment there is really a split of the countries in the European Union I, and I wanted to bridge this over. Yeah. May, may I add something to this discussion? Sister, Look, you're one of the it, border countries. Yes, of course, and uh, I must say two or three things uh, very quickly. First of all, when Germany decided to take this willkommen approach Nobody asked us. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. They were all coming from Greece, through the Balkan area, Central Europe, to Sweden. I mean, that was no coordination. We were all somehow victim of one strange decision who forced, which forced us to do something which we were not prepared for. Secondly, several countries behaved very irresponsibly in th at the first stage of this massive migration process. From Greece to Slovenia, we were the first country. Greece, Macedonia, Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia. Slovenia was the first country which registered mm -hmm. those coming, put things in the order, helped them with food and everything because they just came like 
you know, uh, express train from Greece to Slovenia, and that was not fair. And that's why we gave our share, our contribution to this by, push, by pushing the EU and other Western Balkan countries to start cooperating on this. And uh, I must say that uh, I cannot do more than to be an example of what I believe in as a Prime Minister. And my politics, my policy here is very clear. We are an active uh, country in the resettlement program. We take part in a relocation program. We try to integrate those re refugees who come and they fulfill the uh, conditions, etc., who want to stay in Slovenia. And we are all time very well connected and in cooperation with other countries. This is all we can do. We are a small country. And if this is a good example, and I believe it is, and I agree that the, the migrants should not uh, dictate where they should go. They should be sub subdued to our, our rules in Europe. If we take such examples as uh, leading ones, then I believe we can all do something uh, much better than we did in the past years. But we, we make progress, I must say. It's very difficult, but we make progress step by step. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I also think that your country's contribution, or also your countries, as well as um, some of the other former uh, countries who were under communism, also still uh, sort of in the Balkans, are still a very important reminder for all of us that living in a war-free zone, living in peace, um, some of us take it for granted, others went through it and still remind it very much, and so there is uh, a human rights, there is a solidarity component to that too. I want to pick up on, you all mentioned values, um, which are very important to the elder family. And I kind of want to push you a little bit on that, um, because there are also arguments out there. We've moved from a values-based uh, society to a society that is shaped by identity. And this is sort of where populism comes in. And I think some of the liberal parties in various countries have also taken a lot of criticism because as you were campaigning, people, some people felt you moved a bit more to the right to sort of appease voters who were, um, kind of didn't like the migration situation. I would like you all to respond a little bit on that, sort of, uh, how are you dealing with the different identities that exist in uh, your countries and uh, bring the values back, but at the same time also recognize we've moved on. We can't just work on values. Prime Minister Rutte. Well, for, for me as a liberal, I will never look at a person as part of a group. Mm. I will always look at a person as a unique person who then decides to be part of a group of uh, uh, pianists <laughs> or <laughs> lovers of the color of green or liberals or being feeling part of that or, or this uh, football club, I don't mind. You have many identities. And <laughs> because of that, I still remember this speech uh, Obama gave in uh, Egypt to the Muslim world. So he was basically telling all these people, you have only one identity, being a Muslim. Yeah, many of the, the big the audience was uh, consisted of people who believe in Allah and who are part of the Muslim faith. But they have so many other identities. Why just put that one stamp on them? No, that's wrong. Um, and secondly, because of this fact, it is crucial that the values are taught in school. And the values in our liberal democracies are clear. That is the equality of men and women, black and white, homo and heterosexual, etc., etc. The freedom of speech, the freedom of religion. Uh, and we have to be much more, much clearer, much more forceful in our schools, particularly with people coming from outside, as refugees or as uh, economic migrants who are not irregular. We have to be very clear, much more than we have done in the past. And this is in our new government program that we want in the schools to, to teach these basic lessons of our values, not identity then people make choices about their identities, not just one. That is in a liberal democracy a key value. But the values underpinning that society, we have to be much clearer about what they are, and we have to be much more vigilant in upholding them and not accepting when people not only are against these values, but even act against these values. Then we have to 
make clear that the, the, the state results power will turn against you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Who else wants to? Well, I, um, I'm not going to repeat him because I, I totally yeah, agree. agree. Um, yeah. But it's we, 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 we have to be proud of liberal democracy and what our values are. And we, we shouldn't take them for granted. And that's what we have been doing. And we just thought and assumed that everybody, at, at a certain moment, we even thought that the whole world would be convinced that liberal democracy and liberal values would spread over the world automatically. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. What you see happening in Russia, what you see happening in Turkey, what you see happening in other places is the other way around. So let's be very careful. Let's stick up to our values um, and defend them, promote them, be proud uh, that we have this liberal democracy and this liberal society. And I agree with Mark that it's something completely different than, than identity. Um, populists tend to mix it up, um, but your identity is yours. It's yours. Nobody else can define what your identity is. And nobody can limit you as a person to only just one identity. You make it yourself. It's like making a lasagna in a way <laughs> you, chose, you choose the layers that you put and whatever you put in it. Uh, and of course, it's important. Some people say that identity is not important. It is important. But the people who make a case out of it, who run a political case on identity, they want to determine in your place what your identity should be. And that's what liberals uh, have to stand for. But we, 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 should, we have to fight this. Make people free. It's your life. Live it. Okay. Yeah. 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 And, and in the same Sarah. time, I think, such a point of view about um, identity, having several identities in the region for a football club or uh, in other terms, is one of the reasons um, to be pro-European. Mm -hmm. Because Europe is diverse in cultures, in languages, uh, in styles of living, in a uh, geographic way. Um, so I think uh, the, those two feelings are going together. And we have to fight for this diversity, not only in Europe, but Europe can celebrate it. And um, making the point that to be diverse in the regions, in the cities, in the member states can be um, in the same time as being united in our principles and the instrument we use because we share the same values and the same principles. And this can be a role model for the rest of the world who is seeking for such a vision to be together as an African continent or in other parts of this uh, um, earth to um, be in a better situation for their people we can help them, but in this way, we have to live our European dream and um, show that united and being different, it's not something that ca uh, cannot uh, go together, but which has to go together to be strong, liberal, and free. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I fully agree with what has just been said by my three colleagues. I would just maybe like to add something very briefly. Democracy, liberal democracy, which is basically democracy we live with some with social and other components included, is very vulnerable. Um, but the, the strongest defense is the one which is taught in kindergarten schools in our co uh, mutual interaction, because if we are strong in our conviction, then this is what we want to be. People with different identities, free people, free-minded people, then it is very difficult to penetrate this uh, with some radical, extreme ideas, uh, generally, I mean. Uh, but of course, we must be aware that abuse of democracy, abuse of these, um, let's say, ideas and values is all the time uh, present somehow, somewhere and somehow, and we must not be passive. This is the point. Yeah. Even though we all understand that these values are important for us, that we want to live there, we want to be like this, if we are passive, if we don't respond to intrusions, to manipulations, to lies, and everything which goes ar 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 along, along to this radical uh, extremism, then we will finally lose. Mm -hmm. And one of the best cases was this Brexit case. There were so many, let's say, lies, so many manipulations in the process of uh, referendum campaign that you don't know really 
what was, uh, whether the final will of the people was corresponding to the true facts. And this is just one case, we have so many. So this is why, especially I believe our group must be very outspoken, very, as I said, uh, loud, uh, while defending all our values. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Again, to make it a bit uncomfortable, because we are too much in agreement. <laughs> um, yeah. If we all agree that, that identities are personal, are for somebody's, for everybody to decide, him or herself, but that the underpinning values are non-negotiable, yeah. then let's agree on the fact that in the 80s and 90s, with so many people from different, back, different cultural backgrounds coming to our societies, we have not been clear enough about our values. Already. We cannot repeat that mistake. We have to be much more vigilant in, in, in explaining to people what type of society we are, what are the values driving us, and again, that we do not accept if people actively uh, engage against these values, uh, and that we then will turn against them. And this is, this is a crucial thing, this, this is a non-negotiable issue, and that is to defend liberalism, otherwise we lose it. I fully agree, and you've been very outspoken on sort of individual responsibility. I want to pick up on something that uh, Prime Minister Seras earlier said about uh, those who are viola violating and ignoring values and actually looking at inside of Europe certain states or countries that have been um, rather negligent or have been infringing on rule, uh, the rule of law. Um, we're looking at some countries inside the EU, uh, Poland, Hungary. Where is ALDE here? Where are you there sort of stepping up? I mean, Germany and France have been uh, outspoken together with the European Commission in terms of um, pushing back, holding uh, um, Poland a bit more, the Polish government a bit more to accountable. You stepped in. How, how are you dealing with that sort of internal EU tension and sort of reminding others, you know, there's a principal fundamental values that you need to follow? Well, I, I think the European, uh, we don't have a, uh, uh, we, have, we have the Lisbon Treaty um, and um, uh, everything coming out of the, our, 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 since 1957, since we started this whole project, has been about common values. So when in countries like Hungary and Poland, we feel that steps are being taken, uh, moving against some of our core principles as a European Union, we have to be very clear about that. And then the question is, who will do that? First of all, I raise these issues in every discussion I have with my colleagues, and every Dutch minister raises these issues in every discussion they have with their colleagues from Hungary and Poland. Secondly, the Netherlands is fairly and squarely behind the European Commission. Frans Timmermans, uh, the first vice president who is working on this, and trying to convince these countries to move back from this path. And if this is not happening, uh, the treaty is very clear about what we have to do next. And, and this is step by step, schiet for schiet. Uh, and we are now in the phase of making clear that this is unacceptable and that we want them to move back from the steps they have taken. And if that is not the case, then it will be the European Commission and we have to support them in taking the next steps. Um, I <laughs> Uh, I'm also quite loud on this issue uh, in the European Council and among our, my colleagues, prime ministers and presidents, uh, we, who I meet uh, on a regular basis and uh, also at home because as a lawyer, professor, law professor, I understand uh, this uh, very well, how important the rule of law is. If there is no respect for the rule of law, then the EU will slowly disintegrate. This is what binds us together, and uh, there is Poland, there is Hungary, there is Croatia, non-implementing the International Court Tribunal. And uh, I am um, very explicit about this, and I think that our liberal colleagues are, Mark, you can confirm this, uh, very uh, expressive here. I mean, we don't, uh, uh, we always say, things about values, about Turkey, about uh, violating the rule of law. And here I think the contribution of other members, prime ministers and others, is very crucial. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Gwendolyn Nicola, do you want to comment on that? Well, yes, in a way it's, um, it relates to, to the previous debate, of course, because it's, uh, th those, those, those key values of a liberal democracy, they are never um, finally won. 
they are never permanent. We need to stick up for them um, to, to each and every person who doesn't want to live up to it. Whether it is, as Mark pointed out, people who live here, uh, extreme religious people, for example, who don't want to respect these basic values, or it's the demons of the past, like nationalism, and in my country, even communism, uh, being, uh, being there again, um, trying to take freedom back from people. It's, it's a continuous battle that we, have to, that we have to do, and we have to win it through the hearts and minds of people, reminding them why freedom is so important. And it's, it's really this basic set of rules. It's the church and, and, and the state, they're separated. It's the right to self-determination, the freedom of speech, and equality of men and women. That's whatever we, that, this is what, how we do it and we should never compromise, never. Um, whether it's to religious people or to nationalists or, uh, I don't know, um, even politicians who think they can control people's minds and lives. Do you have the feeling you can contribute to this, just as uh, the two prime ministers mentioned that what they're doing within the council? Are you on parliamentary level able to talk to counterparts um, to sort of push them on this? Again, sort of bringing it down to the individual people level and the responsibilities. Well, of course, what the, the prime ministers have to do is, is do this step-by-step -step approach together with the European Union and what we as liberals uh, should do as politicians. And, and we did it yesterday. I've heard Guy said it in the speeches, very outspoken and as ever. Um, we, should, we should make sure that everybody knows what's going on because if everybody remains silent, they will take it one step further every time and then we will wake up and it's too late. So we will, we will, ha we will have to make noise about it, about it and then let the European Commission um, go step by step. And I think this base in the regions of uh, um, talks, um, of relations, of um, um, Erasmus programs and others can reach out also um, the debate and clearly we have to really um, ex um, reinforce those values and principles, the rule of law, but in the same time we also had problems. Um, as you mentioned, for example, the situation uh, two years ago when those uh, refugees coming and there was no um, common answer on this, but you were more and more alone. I think this was the beginning of splitting off uh, in the European Union, and maybe we have also to react on both on the principles and values, yes, but also on having a better solution to reach out. And so the, the actual proposition, for example, um, from uh, Mr. Macron for having a new zone in the Euro zone, a uh, new institution, and even uh, in the relation of Germany and France, we want to renew all this engine of France and Europe, uh, and, and France, uh, France and uh, Germany. But what I doesn't want is that this is only a Western part, is only a part of the big countries, but I wanted more the triangle of Germany, um, uh, France and Poland, for example, in the Weimar Triangle, to not have the situation of splitting off, uh, off uh, in the eastern and the western part, bigger or uh, smaller countries, um, more uh, um, migration in the countries and not more migration. I want really to tie up in the discussion to find a common solution and maybe we have to re restart those debates on the um, rule of law, but in the same time also how we can help another um, to have the rule of law and to put with the people in Europe exactly. that they are yeah. not afraid about all those changements we see for the moment and which are sometimes um, hard to bear. Uh, and sometimes people are afraid, what is this making with my life, with my future? And to, to, um, to sign them up that there is a future in this European Union that we can find solution which works that we will deliver that and not only discuss, then we have to be quite near uh, all together and not in part of Europe. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I agree. Gwendolyn one uh, one final thing we need to do, but um, and, and we've been doing it so far, uh, if we are a union of the people, by the people, for the people, let's be side by side with the people in those mm -hmm. countries. And you see this happening. It, it's the governments deciding on something that is not okay. They want to 
break the rule of law, they want to take freedom away, but it's the citizens in those countries who really are uh, s reaching out. As liberals, let's be uh, right beside them, let's help them, let's, let's help these citizens' movements or parties, and my own party, as Guy uh, knows, we had a celebration 25 years ago, it's called the, the Party of Citizens, you see it everywhere throughout Europe. As liberals, this is our goal, this is what we should do, be a party of citizens. Yeah. Prime Minister, you had a... Well, uh, just two, two remarks. Uh, one is to make it a bit more uh, uh, political. Um, I'm almost amazed that we are not much clearer as an older group about the fact that Viktor Orban is still a member of the exactly. EVP. Uh, and why don't we... Why, don't, why are we not much more explicit about the fact that we find this strange, to put it mildly? Uh, and particularly if we know that some of the very big government leaders in Europe are sitting at the table in the pre-summit lunches together with Viktor Orban. That's one. Uh, secondly, about this French-German access, of course it's there. It is, a, it is an important um, 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 engine in the European Union. And I do like many of Emmanuel Macron's proposals on fighting terrorism, on a asylum policy, etc., etc. But there is one issue where I would argue that we have to be very careful. And these are the ideas about the future of the European monetary mm -hmm. side, the, the euro. Uh, because there was a basic promise to the EU. The basic promise was that by implementing in each of our countries the necessary reforms, we would collectively move to a higher level of um, welfare and success. And some countries have not done that. And because of that, there is now a debate that we should then transfer some of our wealth to the countries who have not implemented the necessary reforms. People sense that. People feel that. And uh, I think we have to debate exactly what Emmanuel Macron means with his ideas, whether there are not elements in those, those ideas who could feed into that feeling that it is about maybe also this transfer idea. And I don't want to end up in a transfer union where Germany and the Netherlands and other countries and Belgium are implementing reforms, doing the necessary stuff, getting their government budgets Slovenia. in place. Servi uh, Slovenia, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Strong leadership. Yeah. Uh, and then having done that, other countries saying, well, we, we were not able to do so because we had our unions fighting it, our populations didn't like it, but we are very happy that you were so successful, could, could we get some of your money? And, and there is this risk of euro bonds, a European finance minister, a European shock absorption mechanism, macroeconomic in, uh, 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 macro uh, imbalances. Uh, I, I would be careful if, yeah. if that would be part of the uh, French-German axis. We're coming to the close of our session and I all would like you to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, elections that are lying ahead of us, but I, I d did want to, as a final comment, one of the things I, I think we should also not forget is there's a lot of talk about a two-speed two Europe or the Eurozone uh, Europe, uh, three concentric circles. I think the migration uh, crisis has also shown that there is another axis within Europe. It's sort of north and south, west and east. Um, so maybe moving forward, uh, the liberal parties can also pick up on, I mean, you're very much in favor of sort of just the differentiated sort of aspects that there are opportunities depending on the subject matters to sort of uh, bring the people in together depending on the issue, as you said earlier on, that we need to solve. I want to use the last few minutes to look forward. The European election is coming up in um, 2019, um, and I know some of the parties are already more active than others. Um, there are some ideas percolating outside. Uh, Macron raised the sort of ideas about the democratic conventions that should take place in the various EU member states. Um, we are also seeing about a, a fragmentation of the electorate, and I think the Netherlands, are, you have a lot of experience with this, yeah. and then also with several parties that you need to bring together with the, in coalition talks. Um, there is also sort of this, um, the research out there that, you know, setting coalition contracts in stone no longer works because, you know, as soon as a crisis comes, coalitions sort of fall apart. So we might need flexible, um, more flexible mechanism. And then also kind of going back to the diversity of, of the population that you all serve in your political um, um, 
positions. How? What are the plans for the Liberals? And then how can you also, uh, I mean, because of the market economy idea, the Liberals tend to still be associated with business. How can the social be brought in a little bit more, so opening um, the Liberal parties up for more diverse electorates? If I could all ask you to maybe bring forward some ideas and uh, so we can also end on a positive note. Well, uh, interestingly enough, my party is now the second biggest party in the Netherlands amongst the poorest people. There is an extreme left-wing socialist party who is the biggest, and then the VVD is the second biggest party about, uh, b uh, among the people low, uh, earning a low income. That would never have been the case 20, 30 years ago, because people sense, is my guess from this, that to get ahead in life, um, uh, you don't need a big state and even more social welfare, welfare but you need jobs. You need uh, entrepreneurship, you need young people to take a risk to start a business and then to create new jobs. And yes, of course, we have an existing welfare system which is good, but we need, don't need to add to these extra layers because that will create uh, too much, uh, um, um, in th that will create in itself not enough new jobs. And that is what it is all about. And I think we liberals should be the, should be the group in Europe who is constantly putting the two main things at, at, at the center of why we are in politics. That's creating safety and it is creating jobs. Those are two, the two main tasks we have as politicians. And it is at the core of liberalism. We create collective safety and security, one, and we are the ones creating enough jobs, etc. And this is also to this point of getting more regular migration from Africa. Maybe it is necessary in some cases. But when we still have, for, for example, in this country, four to five percent of people unemployed, and many of them being able uh, to work because they are not, uh, let's say, disabled. Uh, so they, are ha they, they could fill uh, jobs in principle, but still not being able to do so. I would be very hesitant in, in creating new avenues of people coming from outside the European Union to the Netherlands to fill those jobs. Because first of all, I think then we have to work on the ones who are in un unemployment at this moment. In Germany, it stands at 4%, here it stands at 5%, I think at 7% in, or 6% in Belgium. So there are still many groups of people who we want to, uh, to, to get a job. So I think that is our core message. We create safety and security first. We create the jobs, and that is the best social protection you can get. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to add that um, the point to be able to do this is to put the people in the center, to invest in people, in the education, in the education system, to uh, enable them to use all their potential creativity to be the base of those new jobs and to be able to fulfill all those very changing new work we will see not only today, but in the future. And so to um, be really as liberals, a movement of, of optimism, of future, and of uh, showing people you are this future. It's not a government creating jobs. It's other people with their ideas for no new enterprises, for new products, for new services, and um, the people who fulfill all this work who create those products, the, they are the basis, and so we have to make them strong, we have to invest in their future in making them strong and enabling them to going further uh, together, and not only in systems, in governments, in uh, gr uh, groups, but really in the individual life of people in our countries. Okay. Okay. Uh. Uh, okay, so very quickly, I believe that any liberal agenda in economy is somehow uh, inevitably uh, dependent on some social elements, social, some social elements, and vice versa. You cannot disconnect this uh, today. In today's world, uh, we are talking about fourth, fifth, sixth, even re uh, industrial revolution. The society is changing, digital society is becoming uh, one of the most important uh, dimension of our life. Etc. So everything is so interconnected that we must really also adapt this liberal idea to this complexity, this new complexity, with the core values we, we spoke about and uh, with this 
basic uh, liberal approach uh, we all understand. But what really matters, if we want to convince our people in anything, we must regain their trust. And the trust is the magic word. We sometimes say, okay, trust is not enough, we need some control, of course. The control is inevitable, is necessary for the society, for the organization, for the state. But if there is no trust, there is no sustainable development, no, no hope for the future, because finally there is always somebody you have to trust, over whom there is no controller. So uh, this is what we must regain as politicians, as uh, all the party. If we, if, we, if we gain this among people, if they trust us, we will be able to lead them, and there will be synergy, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I want to refer to something that Mark said, um, because I, I totally agree. I think the big difference uh, between uh, socialism and liberalism is that socialism tries to manage misery, and that what we try to do is create prosperity. That's the biggest difference. <laughs> so, <laughs> it all wraps up in, in these three P. It's like, it's about prosperity, it's about peace and keeping people safe, and it's about people. It's about you. <laughs> That's Europe. <laughs> I find it uh, indicative that you all spoke about the population and none of you uh, um, Men, yeah, n nobody, none of you um, picked up on the European thing. So uh, that was one part of my question is, are you going to have conventions on Europe? But time, time's up. Okay, uh, okay. time is... <laughs> <laughs> I get strong. So how about no, both of you? <laughs> <laughs> Quick. No, I don't want to have the last word. I mean, it's okay. Are you going? But how about just a yes or no? Are you going to have conventions okay. on Europe in your countries? I mean, yes. This yeah. is an idea coming yes. out of Definitely. France, which in itself is not, it's not bad to have discussions about everything in society. That's good. But my worry is that if you would force countries to organize these conventions, that you will basically start to to uh, pontificate, to to tell people why Europe is important, etc. And the best way to to show that there is um, merit to working together in the European Union is by showing people what is happening outside Europe, that we have to work together to stay safe. Secondly, show the amount of jobs being created by the fact that we work together here in the Netherlands. Two million jobs directly connected to the fact that we are an exporting country and 70% of that export is within the European Union. So that is your case. And thirdly, because we have these common values. And, and by, by showing that and making that real, and as Gwendolyn said, not expanding the tasks of the European Union, but trying to get it more focused, a, a, a more uh, focused European Union, uh, I'm convinced that you don't need to, to, to preach the gospel, because then it sells itself, because it shows in its uh, results. Okay, thanks. Okay. I want to give the final words to... Um, Vice Chairman Paquet from the Friedrich Naumann Foundation to close the session. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to be very brief uh, because uh, we are already over time uh, by 15 minutes. I think people, prosperity, and peace. This was really the right way of summarizing what we liberals stand for. And I, th I, I was very impressed by this panel because uh, due to the guidance of uh, Mrs. Hurst, we uh, also tackled quite a few very controversial issues. And this shows, uh, the spirit in which we discuss these issues shows that within the values that we liberals represent, there is scope for intensive passionate discussion on the basis of these values and we are lib liberals do not have any fear or German angst or whatever uh, to really speak out on these issues and find long-term solutions in a humanitarian liberal spirit. Thanks very much 
for this wonderful discussion. I must say I'm very proud that we hosted this discussion as the Friedrich Naumann uh, Foundation. Uh, it was one of the best discussions we ever hosted, I may say, at this point. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, let me finally, just a second, just a second, I have one announcement to make. We had hope. Uh, we had hoped that our party leader, leader from the Free Democrats in Germany, Christian Lindner, uh, would arrive in time to uh, be with us in this uh, discussion round. This was not possible because the plane was late. He is now on his way, and as I was just uh, informed, he is three minutes away. So we decided to the following procedure that he's giving a very brief keynote at the beginning of the next session. So we are looking forward to this keynote, but now we make a little break to recover. Thank you very much. <laughs>